All right, it's a little after seven, so we will go ahead and get the meeting started. Thank you for that one. Um, before we get started with the land acknowledgement, just a sort of how are we going to have this meeting work tonight? We have a microphone up front in the middle here, so as people come forward to present their public comments, um, we'll use that microphone. There's no mic stand. It is kind of loud, which is good. We can all hear each other, but just speak directly into it, and then we'll do our best to pass the microphone up here as we uh, share the uh, folks who speak. So, Leslie. Uh, Thank you. We open our meeting with the acknowledgement of all local indigenous peoples, including the Puyallup tribe of Indians who inhabited this land. We embrace their continued connection to this region and thank them for their stewardship throughout the generations. Let us now take a moment to pay respect to their elders and to all the Puyallup people, past and present. Thank you, everyone. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you for being here, and thank you for your uh, contributions via email, letters, and, uh, and the engagement that we've had here in the last uh, few weeks. Uh, public comment, uh, we have set aside a half an hour for that, and there's a lot of people want to speak. People have signed up in order. We'll try to go through that, and to allow the opportunity for the most people to speak, we're encouraging people to keep their comments uh, under three minutes. And um, look forward to hearing what you have to share. Uh, Slade, do you want to be MC and call people in order? Yes, thank you. Uh, and once again, thank you everybody for coming this evening. But we have Casey Alanis, uh, first public speaker. Right, and then Jill Reichschneider will be uh, next. And then Layla after that. Testing. Thank you. Hey, everyone, hear me? Casey, if you, if you wouldn't mind coming to the center, I'll let everybody know that's where to go. This is where you'll stand when it's your turn. <laughs> I'm going to speak very quickly. Number one, during the board work group meeting last week, Catherine Coleman said that after cutting MSOCs and other ancillary budget items, it was, in quotes, time for student services to take their fair share of the cuts that other departments are experiencing. Another option for the board to consider is to reduce district administration FTE by 0.1 or 0.2. This would keep their pay raises and benefits intact while having a greater impact on the bottom line since these staff members are the highest paid. Their workloads, however hard, cannot fairly be compared to nearby districts such as Tacoma as we have only three schools. DEA and BESP staff have the same workload as any other district with less district resources to share. Students are at the heart of student services, and the cuts to staffing proposed don't come close to aligning with the projected decline in enrollment. Perhaps the district administration can take their fair share of the cuts to help bridge this gap. Number two, the district recently spent a significant amount of time and money on a strategic plan, including how to address the woeful access and equity issues for students of color, students with disabilities, and ELL students in our small district. The proposed cuts to staffing could be read nearly line by line next to the strategic planning. It is shameful to think about reducing funding to services that are already under-resourced and that were just identified in the strategic planning as needing support. It is absurdly short-sighted and counterproductive. It also makes it much harder to attract and retain students to increase enrollment. Number three, the bigger picture concern I have, board, is the mismanagement and abuse of the relationship between the district administration and the board, and the district administration and the unions. The unions voted in good faith for raises without knowing that the budget was in a deficit this large. Likewise, the board voted on these same raises and those of the administration in good faith without knowing these cuts to student services were imminent. Student, excuse me, systems work when all the stakeholders feel that they are part of collaborative decision-making process with all the information they need to contribute in a meaningful way. Holding a meeting with the unions in quotes to answer questions with 48 hours left until the board vote is not open communication. It's being told what has already been decided. Holding a board work group meeting that leaves no true room or time for the board to actually work to 
ask questions, to do their research, and to propose changes that the administration then has time to rework and come back to answer, looks and feels like their role in the budget process is not wanted or respected. It seems people know the difference between being told their voices are valued and actually being invited to the table to collaborate in the process. Thank you. and then we'll have Susan Swan. I never imagined that this island's elementary school would make music a part-time teacher position, but it did. This common core subject is now a sometimes subject. It looks like McMurray Middle School is now looking at losing some art, French, and music, and the high school is due to lose some art. These are precious subjects that keep students engaged. This year, our young readers are not attending library on a regular basis. The children are missing our librarians' magical lessons that cultivate a love of learning. I thank our dedicated librarian for finding time to continue to support teachers' resources and enrich learning in our classrooms. Our custodial staff, cut before the pandemic, has less staff expected to meet the same work demands. The lack of cleanliness is noticeable despite the hard work of staff. Our grounds and facilities and our food service personnel are being treated in the same manner. The work demands remain the same, but the ability of our dwindling staff to succeed at their jobs are diminished each year. The rift cuts are more the rift cuts more people from these departments. Our special education and tier two support providers are working through lunches and planning periods to help children who qualify for their services. It is of utmost importance for us to have a fully staffed special education team of teachers, psychologists, paraeducators, and therapists with reasonable caseloads in order to address our students' needs. This is not the current situation, and a RIF will make circumstances even worse. A full complement of well-compensated paraeducators is required to assist students who qualify <laughs> for Tier 2 reading, Tier 2 math, social emotional learning, those that accompany our most happy students throughout their day, the talented educators who provide Tier 2 math support, prevent children from falling through the cracks, yet RIF eliminates our math support coordinator. As COVID cases continue to plague our classrooms, our nursing staff continues to tend to the health needs of our most vulnerable and injured. The plan is to replace an RN with an LPN. We need a highly qualified registered nurse to care for the multitude of health care concerns in our learning community. During last week's staff meeting that focused on behavior expectations, my thoughts and concerns were on the riff of the behavior specialist support position. Our skilled behavior support specialists assist children with behavior IEPs five days a week. Children who can experience emotional turmoil at any time, anywhere during the school day. The behavior support specialist is paramount to, to the success of the special education program. This critical position impacts our entire learning community. The suggestion that raising enrollment could solve our woes makes me wonder. Who would want to attend a district that cannot serve its students' needs? <laughs> the new strategic plan relies on a professional staff that is adequate in quantity and professional in nature. Without the staff, the plan is just a piece of paper with an idea on it. It was hard to sit through last week's staff meeting that highlighted this plan, knowing it is getting less possible with each budget cut. So after late, it'll be Susan Swan and then Nan Van Poot. Thank you. I'm actually reading a letter written by Jennifer Lindsay, my friend and former colleague from the fifth grade. Um, Dear Vashon School Board members, I understand the budget cuts are on the table. Having read the Beachcomber article on this topic, I write with several wonderings and concerns. While I did not participate in the strategic planning process this academic year, I appreciate that a core tenet was embracing diverse voices and perspectives. This new plan aims to guide the district for the next five years. I would like to understand the alignment between the articulated 2022 strategic plan process and proposed cuts. I'm aware that BE, the VEA contract was ratified and the budget changes were announced days afterward. 
I wonder to what extent district perspectives and collaboration was sought from any of the following groups. Equity teams, school staff-based equity teams, student teams, or the Racial Equity Advisory Board, professional lead teams, school staff meetings. At these pivotal moments when ideas and creativity are needed from folks on the ground, this input is especially vital. When educators and students, those most affected and on the ground, are sought as authentic collaborators on a complex problem, it is a shared problem. Everyone has a stake in the solution, even and especially when there are difficult trade-offs to be made. How are budget priorities aligned with staff priorities, instructional improvement, and student learning? How were diverse voices and perspectives included in a budget priority process? Decreased contractual time will disrupt collaboration planning and cycles of inquiry, some of the named strategies for goals of the continuous improvement of teaching practice. As outlined in the plan, teacher quality is a key component of engaging culturally relevant instruction. We know that these past few years have really stretched all district staff. Reducing teaching and support staff will impact everyone's job performance, thus also student learning. Further, if full-time positions are reduced to 0.8 FTE, what happens to collaborative planning time? Having been a teacher for three decades, I know it is the rare teacher who only works their contract hours. Implementation of new learning and collaborative inquiry-focused instructional shifts as outlined in the strategic plan is complex and important work that requires more, not less, dedicated time from teachers. How does the proposed budget prioritize students most impacted by educational injustice and inequities that will not be further impacted by budget cuts? On average, the majority of Ashan students expressed a favorable opinion of their schooling experiences in the stated equity priorities on the strategic plan. However, disaggregated analysis of student survey results, educational attainment, and assessment of access to opportunities spotlighted consistent challenges for specific student groups. These equity priority student groups will receive focused atten uh, attention as we implement our strategic plan. Mm -hmm. Students of color, low-income students, English language learners, students with disabilities, neurodiverse students, non-binary students. Mm -hmm. this, is this is a hard time for everyone, most especially students. They need to feel inspired and excited to go to school more now than ever. The arts are vital parts of the school day. Paraprofessionals make it possible for students to have one-to-one -one and small group support. A lifeline to students getting back into focus with face-to-face -face learning. But please, don't just take my word for it. Their strategic plan learning process presumably gave invaluable insight regarding where we need to go as a district. This seems like a time to engage with it again, with the diverse voices most impacted by the hopes outlined within. Further, making it a routine practice to seek broad, diverse voices in authentic and equitable ways. This takes longer, it's usually messier and harder, but pays off in the long run because decisions are informed and collectively shared. For this budgeting decision, I hope that you will talk to student groups, talk with educators about what matters most to them right now and going forward, and consider creating building leadership teams that include the diverse voices who will be most impacted by decisions. <laughs> the district Budget Advisory Board. Is this a permanent board or a newly formed group for this decision? Sincerely, Jen Lindsay. Thank you, Leila. Susan, and then it'll be Nan, and then Uh, Vanessa Richter. Hi there. I'm here as a fifth grade parent with a child registered for sixth grade band. I'm opposed to reducing the band program at McMurray for these reasons. It's an impossible ask for the band director to teach beginners how to play an instrument while also developing intermediate and advanced musicians in the same room at the same time. We don't ask our foreign language to mix beginners with other levels. We don't ask any of our core classes to mix beginners with any other levels. We shouldn't ask our band to do that. Number two, public education is about providing opportunity and access. Eliminating the sixth grade band is an equity issue. If students are not provided with a reasonable place to learn an instrument, they will not be able to play an instrument unless they can afford a private lesson. 
Number three, I understand this is a numbers game. The numbers of students enrolled in band is down at the moment, but the numbers don't tell the whole story. Of all the courses, band has been hit the hardest by the required online learning during COVID. Just three years ago, there were 45 students enrolled in sixth grade band, then COVID hit. We can and should get those numbers back to those numbers up to 45 again as schooling returns to normal. Finally, number four, this unique middle school to high school cohort experience all starts with a sixth grade band program dedicated to choosing and learning an instrument. Please reconsider eliminating this vital collective. that um, not all of you know me, even though I have been here, well, 16 years, but this last year was 17, but I have been on medical leave for a year. So I am the only school occupational therapist. Um, name is Nan Van Putten. Um, the OT position serves just to make sure that everyone is aware of this. Um, ECAP, Developmental Preschool, uh, grades K through 5, McMurray High School, this is one FTE, um, as well as Family Link, Student Link, Harbor School students, and some students who are not connected with any of those programs. Um, we qualify students in the area of fine motor, which is um, hand development, um, eye hand coordination, dexterity, strength, grasp, all of that, um, visual motor, visual um, perceptual, um, and most of the referrals that, that I get um, are for, most of them are for handwriting challenges. Um, but obviously, we, we serve um, the whole spectrum of, of students um, from from very, very high need, um, nonverbal to, you know, everything that you can imagine. Um, all right, so uh, just to give you an idea of what the job is. Um, all right, oh, and I want to add here that over the last several years, I have observed, and I believe it's been observed uh, by other special ed um, professionals, that the children who are coming to us have higher, higher, greater needs, other than not less so. Okay? We're more than that. Typical, typical, typical kids, I can't speak, learn best with repetition, multiple opportunities for learning. This need is greatly magnified for kids with special needs. Although not necessarily a standard approach, um, I had 75 to 80% of my students on schedule for direct service time twice a week. And I see one-on-one, -on -one, okay? I don't see kids in groups. When I had a caseload of 40, 42 kids, yes, I have to see a couple kids, but it's not effective. Okay. Um, because that is what is needed for best outcomes. That is why I saw kids twice a week. Um, and that, and, and on Vashon, that's what we support. That's what we do here. And I was thinking of, um, of Slade, your comment. I don't expect you to bring it to your mind right at the moment, but last um, board meeting last Thursday, you were relating um, what is typical um, for hiring a 1.0, I think it was counselor, it could have been a site, or a certain number of students. It, it's recognized by all that that is just not appropriate. It's, it's just not functional. Um, so typical um, student service is um, 30 minutes once a week. Um, all right. You're at about four minutes. 
What? You had about four minutes. Okay. I'm lost. Um, at the time my medical leave began, many of my students had emerging skills. And with emerging skills present, it is very important that um, students, uh, to give the student the time support needed to fully develop those skills. Um, I do not know the reasoning behind the changes in, direct, in student direct service minutes since I left on medical leave, but I have reviewed that this week, and nearly half of these students, um, their direct service minutes were decreased by 50%. And again, I don't know the reasoning, um, but that's, that's pretty drastic. Um, okay, I am wondering if the district is looking towards, and again, I do not know if this is true, but I, I can't help but wonder with proposing um, a point two uh, cut that I'm wondering if the student is looking towards adopting a consult model for OT with the proposed redirection of a point two reduction cut of point two. Although consulting with students, teachers, um, students, teachers, uh, special ed teachers, paraprofessionals, parent communication, I do not feel, which is what we do, routinely. I do not feel this model would uh, be sufficient support for achieving students' individual potential. There is no way in which we can totally uh, pass on our education, the background of our knowledge, experience, judgments, and skills. If this position is cut, it will negatively influence um, students. Um, so I implore you not to cut the, the OT position. And then Anna Shamsky. Hi, uh, my name is Vanessa Richter, and I have been an Islander for five years. I have a second grader in um, Miss Gill's multi age and incoming kindergartner who also uses uh, speech therapy. Thank you, teacher Rebecca. Um, I am the product, proudly, of public education, and I am the daughter of a teacher. Um, and uh, I was also a former high school student school board member and I just want to acknowledge that I feel um, that everyone in this room must have such mixed emotions this is so challenging it's hard and um, I do not envy your position tonight um, I am super passionate about this community if you know me you'll know that about me and if you don't know you will find that out um, I am deeply inspired what this community has achieved. I am, I think when something is impossible, Vashon can do it. I think of Opal and Dorothy and hearing that they opened a health center, and had group health contract with a non-group health entity for the first time. Vashon Island did that. I think that COVID testing, we created a COVID testing system that not even health insurance, which I work for at Kaiser Permanente, could do as quickly as the Medical Reserve Corps. With wow. <laughs> and that's because of this community. This community brings people who want to be on an island. We're all in this together. We're awkwardly going to bump into each other at the grocery store, and we know that this is going to happen. We're passionate. We we put things in the newspaper. I'm super nervous that I'm going to be in the newspaper tonight. <laughs> but I cannot solve tonight. I know that it's lots of work and a lot of effort and a lot of emotion. What I can tell you is that I'm a bit of a policy geek, and I learned that the McCleary decision is something that we should deeply look at in terms of how this community activates to change. <laughs> It has no representation of funding for tenured faculty, teachers, staff. How can that be? Not every school is going to have new teachers. And we're, this community, I want teachers who've been here. Believe me, I actually I wish I was going to come back about years and years ago. I know I will never truly be because I haven't been here for generations. I want the third grade program. I want choir. I want band. I moved here because I want those things. And so I cannot solve that tonight. But what I can say is, how 
can we activate? Look at everyone in here tonight. Every one of you knows someone who is a little bit nervous to come tonight. Why can't we do something? Why can't we look at how we can engage together and make change? That won't change the budget tonight, and I'm sorry about that. But how can our parents and families get involved more? I want to create reading groups. I want to go out in the garden. I want to do those things. I want other people to do them. I know that you do too. Sarah, I know you. <laughs> I want to be involved. And I think that we can create those programs. That's what this community is about. And so how do we work together to make that happen? Because I think what drives enrollment and people being here are those unique things about our community. That's what the are.
Uh, we have not raised specifically for that purpose in over nine years. We now fund enhanced programming. But that doesn't mean that we can't pick up some of the issues um, in order to free up general funds to go to other allocations. So uh, we're looking at avenues to do that, um, to save outdoor school, to save exploratory week, and to hopefully alleviate some of this pinch that we're all in. So um, we don't have specifics on that yet, but. Um, we are hoping to do some substantial mitigation and, and change the story that is on the page now. I think those of you who've been through a budgeting process understand that this time of year is, is kind of the most awful story that could be presented. And then uh, we have some time to fix it, depending on luck and uh, avenues uh, that present ourselves. So not everything has to be a cut, but maybe it's a shuffle. Maybe it's an additional idea. And those are the kind of things the foundation is involved in looking at with, uh, with the district staff. So um, hang tight. Uh, donating to the foundation would be a good way to help address what's happening right now. Um, so we're, we're excited to do that. Um, and lastly, just on a, on a personal note, as a former school board member and somebody who's been involved in public service for the last eight years, I do want to say personally, that I was very disappointed in the tone of the Beachcomber editorial this morning. Um, I felt that it was uh, it was ignorant of the current educational staffing issues. Um, that it was not accurate in reflecting the need for uh, you know raises because of inflationary pressures, not only in education but in many other industries. Um, I felt that it misrepresented the budgeting process that the district goes through every year with the union groups and the staffing. Uh, and frankly, I just thought it was mean. I thought it was mean uh, in an explicit and personal way to, um, to people who least deserve it. So uh, I just want to say that the Swiss Foundation is looking to be part of the solution. And uh, we'd rather focus on solutions than fault. We know that we're all part of one big family, and while these times are full of pressure and everyone is full of anxiety. At the end of the day, we all come together and our, our parent speaker there was right. We bash on makes everything possible. So um, your donations as school families and as community members to the Schools Foundation will help us mobilize just that much more quickly to help um, the district uh, get, get some of this nasty writing off the page and replace it with something we'd all much rather read. So, um, please donate. Please keep doing all the good work you're doing. I know you work hard and for an amazing amount of hours and it really shows the product that we deliver and the product that people come here to seek out. So thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. And um, we'll, we'll have details coming forward shortly. Thank you, Raven. And our last speaker, Colby. Hello, good to see you all. I'm Chloe Gaiman, um, and the wonderful, you just tell everyone what your name is. Okay. Please say Aaliyah. Okay, she's going to be shy, but she is fully integrated in our special services. And, um, we couldn't do our job without the job of everyone. Um, and uh, the thought of, do you want to give a kiss to everybody? Go ahead. Yes. Do you want to say, I need you? Hey, can you look out into the crowd and say, who do you know? I need you, Miss Terry. I need you, Miss Nan. I need you, Kathy, for that. I need you. Anyway, so um, before I take up too much time, the lovely Miss Kennedy here is going to co speak just so we can make sure all the voices are heard. Um, but yes, again, when it comes to special services, and our uh, lovely people here tonight, please reconsider. And Kennedy, come on up. Okay. I'm just going to stay here. Hi, uh, my name is Kennedy, and um, I'm here to ask you to not cut special ed services at Chautauqua. Um, we are moving to Vashon in about a month, and my son, Lad, uh, is going to be a first grader, and he is was born with a very rare genetic condition, and he also has autism. And OT and para support are two of the things that he needs most here. 
Um, he is a totally brilliant, amazing kid. He taught himself to read at the age of three. He loves letters and spelling, and he can't write his name. And so to be part of his class and to access the curriculum that he is capable of participating in, he needs that OT support, and he needs that twice a week, that he is the kid that needs the twice a week that they were talking about. It's the same thing with a para. He loves other kids. He's super silly and goofy, and he also has no idea how to engage in play. The stuff that comes naturally to other kids, to join in, he doesn't know, and so he wanders away. And without the pair of support, without the eyes of more staff, he's, he's going to have a way more isolated childhood than he would with that extra support. So I drove from the east side of Seattle um, on about two hours' notice tonight to my pair of support. to be part of this community and thanks for letting me kind of hop on in here um, but yeah just here to say please don't cut those services my kids can only act my kid can only access his education here with that kind of support so thank you cool. thank you very much and welcome to that one I know that uh, there's many more voices and perspectives, and thank you for sharing all your emails and your letters. We really do read and take to heart each one of those. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, critical as part of the process. Um, next up is uh, the superintendent report, and then after that we'll go to the uh, student board representative remarks. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to welcome tonight to uh, our, every month we have a building administrator come and share kind of what's happening at, the, at their building. And so tonight I have Greg Allison from Murray Middle School who will be joining us and giving a, uh, a report to the board on what's, what's happening with, the, with our Mustangs. Yes, yes, all right. Uh, well, thank you. And I'll just share just a couple of cool highlights of what's going on. And first off, uh, spring has definitely sprung, uh, even though the weather might not show it out there. It's a little chilly. But uh, if you've been in a middle school, you know that that brings with it a certain amount of energy uh, in any middle school. Uh, and so our staff uh, has kind of gotten together and really rallied uh, together to how can we really make uh, this spring finish well and um, really, I guess, keep our kids really engaged and in classes. And I just want to give a shout out to all of our staff for rallying together and just collaborating to make our hallways safe, our classrooms safe, and really uh, finishing the year well so uh, students can engage really well in their academics and, and make some final progress. So kudos uh, to our staff. Um, we are returning to some cool traditions uh, at McMurray, and uh, last Friday we enjoyed a, a super partnership with Bashman Allied Arts. And I want to name like Bashan Schools Foundation and Pi and Face. Uh, we had a Be Curious Day, and we've had this uh, event happen a few times at McMurray. We hosted 15 different uh, artists, local artists, who came in and did workshops for our students for about two and a half hours. And uh, Casey, you remember that a long time ago. We planned that. And so thank you to um, Steph Blumgren, who did just an amazing job placing students in those programs. And thanks to Terry and uh, Kelly, who made the trains run on time that day, which was really cool. We're also, uh, speaking of Exploratory Week, uh, Reagan, we are getting back to our Exploratory Week tradition for our eighth graders this year. Uh, we've got kids traveling uh, to Costa Rica and Washington, DC and a group that's going, uh, actually Alex is leading a, an outdoor uh, group to Eastern Washington, which we, we met with uh, It's an overnight and cool uh, outdoor experience, a lot, as well as some local uh, Seattle events, uh, biking, and what's the last one? I can't remember, cooking, or no, art. We've got art and cooking, so some cool experiences and it's great to, to get back to normal. Um, Mentors, we've been working hard to transition our fifth graders. A um, few people mentioned they had fifth grade students, and uh, it's a great tradition every year to welcome our fifth graders. And we had over 60 seventh grade students 
who applied to be McMurray mentors, uh, which is a cool testament to kind of their ability to, to bring our, our students in and so forth. And so uh, we want our students to feel welcomed and informed and ready to engage day one. So it's been, been super awesome. Uh, kudos to Ma uh, Mallory Scholl and Yvette Butler for leading that uh, effort in our school. And then finally, um, McMurray has enjoyed over the last four years uh, the as part of the Best Starts for Kids grant, we have um, the Espert uh, counseling program that has been a grant that we've enjoyed over the last four years. And over 600 students have been screened kind of to help understand a little bit more about their social emotional uh, well-being and their mental health. And over 120 of those students have been referred to services as a result of that. So um, our neighbor care partnership with Megan Crumpets and Yvette Mallory and others are really a powerhouse team to help our students feel, feel uh, safe and get supported, particularly in this time. And VISD was just approved for a $220,000 annual grant by uh, King County over the next uh, six years. So that's a, a cool, we're gonna continue that off. So some great, great things happening at McMurray. And thanks to Toby and Mario for joining us uh, to walk the halls at McMurray uh, last week. Uh, I have to follow that, of course, with our, my COVID-19 update. Uh, so, um, but it is, it, we have to recognize that COVID's still with us. And it is uh, somewhat sobering to understand that even as we kind of navigate uh, what some might be calling the transition to an endemic, but we have had a recent surge here on the island and that's reflected not only in the community, but also in our schools. And, um, you know, it, it's, in some cases it feels like a drip, in some cases it feels like the spigot's been turned full, full on again. Um, but a shout out to all of our staff and, and parents and, and folks just trying to mitigate what it, what it, you know, what it's like to be out of school, even if you're a staff member or a student. And so it takes, we're, we're still pushing through that, uh, that extreme challenge. Uh, levels since spring break uh, from 418 to 512, we've had 76 students and 18 staff members uh, with COVID. And so those are some significant numbers since spring break. Um, but I'd also, you know, kind of like to uh, give a, a, a shout out to Melissa Aguilera Lopez and Laura McKnight, who have been manning our testing site. Uh, um, and sometimes on the weekends when we were, you know, hit hard with the uh, Omicron variant right after the, uh, the winter break. We do have some good news in terms of support and resources. We received news from the Return to Learn program, which is uh, funding provided by the government, the feds that go through OSPI, and who actually fund our services for, with Laura McKnight and Melissa Aguilera Lopez. And that Return to Learn program is going to continue for next year. So uh, that grant will open up and we will put in for you know extra funding. Uh, but some of that good news too is that you may not, of course, you, it's not that you may not know this, I'm assuming you would, you would automatically know this, is that our school nurses also uh, work with students who have COVID and families who have COVID. And so I'm intending, uh, once that grant opens up, I'm hoping that some of that money can offset, some of that grant money can offset some of our nursing services staff because of the time that they spend uh, working with, with COVID and, and all the circumstances that families have to again work through while their students uh, or themselves are either isolated or quarantined. And so we intend to expect uh, you know, financial support through the ESD. And then we also are going to see uh, testing support as well. And so we'll see uh, the, a similar number of tests come into the district that we will receive from the ESD. Um, currently, you know, we're well stocked in, in tests. And so lastly, I just, in terms of my COVID update, I'd just like to encourage anybody in the community and please pass the word, our testing site is open to anybody in the community. Uh, that, anybody and everybody. So, um, and then uh, I'd also want to encourage you to get your boosters. Um, and some of us, uh, I, I, I hear encouraging words for some of our littlest ones. I don't have the final update on that. Um, but if you're able to, and, and you feel like you have a relationship with someone who might be hesitant, um, this would be still be a time to encourage them to get, get vaccinated or get boosted. And then there's just a few community events I'd like to invite people to. The Mukai Day of Exile, I'd like to just highlight. That's gonna be on May 15th at one o'clock. 
And so if you don't know, that's a very special um, ceremony. And we recently, if you read in the Beachcomber, uh, Peter Whitbrook, our communication specialist, uh, did a nice uh, article on the cherry tree blossoms and the impact of our, you know, on the Japanese community when they were interred. Also, I'd like to uh, spotlight on May 21st from 3 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, please, please, please uh, go to the Mercadito, uh, which is the Latino outdoor market. And it's titled, the title of this, or the theme this year is Como La Flor. And so that's going to be the Sheffield building. And raise your hand if you know where the Sheffield building is. Okay, great. We're, we're all on dash on, right? <laughs> And so, uh, also, uh, if you haven't seen, there's still an opportunity. I think uh, Danny Rock, um, he was not able to be here this evening, but he kind of almost has, well, not single-handedly, because there's a lot of people in the background, but he has certainly been leading the charge to get at least 550 of our community members and students to attend the Mariners game on May 27th at 7.05. Who are here? Come on, Evan. This is, right, exactly. Let's go. Okay, it's, 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 it's our year. Uh, we are over 500 tickets to meet that 550 goal. So that's, and if we get 550 tickets sold, then we will have five of our kids go out on the mound and one of them will be selected to throw the first pitch. So, so that, doesn't, that, that doesn't sell you on it. Um, but I think, honestly, Danny told me that he's gonna be buying some extra tickets to, to, get, to make the 550 and then hopefully, you know, kinda, uh, either give them out or, or sell them out uh, later, but he's super passionate if you know him and he loves organizing these big events and so uh, You know, there's a, a link that I sent out in my uh, Update today my community update So please take a look at that if you want to join us or just reach out to the high school and Danny Rock And then last but not least tomorrow uh, Please come and join us at the Nisqually League track meet. We have one of the most amazing facilities uh, you will find in King County or Pierce County, and our students, our track students, have been working really hard all season uh, for this Nisqually track, uh, League track meet. That's from 12 to 6 p.m. And um, you know, come out, cheer the Pirates on. Our our girls uh, team have been constantly winning their meets. Our boys are kind of in a developmental uh, season. Uh, that's one way to put it. Uh, but they they're really working hard, and we have a, a, an amazing group of seniors out there. Uh, that it would be great to show up and support those uh, track kids as they can finish their their uh, their season with us. And then, lastly, for my superintendent's report, and I appreciate you uh, paying uh, coming along with me on this one. May 26th, we're going to have a uh, this is for the board. We're going to have a board work session, which will be part three of our equity policy work. If you don't know out there, we've been working. We've had two work sessions before where we are. Uh, refreshing and revising our equity policy 3212 to align with our strategic plan. That's going to be from 6 to 7.15, our work session, followed by a regular board meeting starting at 7.30 and going till 9 o'clock, and that's on May 26th. And then June 9th, we will have the last work session for our equity policy, which is the fourth work session, same thing, 6 o'clock to 7.15 uh, with Dr. Nikampan, and then June 9th, our board meeting will start at 7.30 again, where we will be um, putting in front of the board a first read of that revised equity policy. I'm very proud of the, the board and, and the community members that have joined us for, for that work, and I'm looking forward to, um, to meeting again uh, after seeing the work that we were able to complete uh, at that last session. So, any questions from the board for my superintendent's report? I didn't anticipate any, but thank you. Next, we'll be introducing our soon-to-be outgoing Gwen Burwell, who's graduating this year, and then uh, Ava. And Ava, Ava, if you don't know this, she's running for class president for for next year. I mean, a, for school president next year, ASB school president. So, co-president. Ava and Jessica. Yes, Ava and Jessica. <laughs> um, so, Gwen and I, um, we meet the student advisory board, which is a group of students that we meet with and discuss like student happenings at VHS and we pre present that summary here. And this is loud. Okay. <laughs> and we present that summary here every month. Um, and recently we held an open student forum, which is super exciting. It was in the theater and it was an open invitation to the student body. And we collaborated with the Racial Equity Pact and the Disabled Advocacy Council. 
um, and leading that discussion. Um, and it was a really productive session. I was very impressed. Um, very respectful, good attendance. Um, we had a discussion format where we encouraged like a turn to talk and then share out. Um, yeah, we gathered some good information, and I think it's cool that um, we were able to have that in like a student-led way. I think that is a much more effective way of gathering information. Um, we had um, staff such as Mr. Ramirez and Nick join us, and yeah. Do you have I think we wanted to have it at the end of the year to so like look forward to next year to see um, things we can work on at the start of the year, and we got a lot of great feedback, and we're figuring out how to put it together and present it to like administration, administration. And, yeah. <laughs> Is the energy at the high school like what Greg described as a middle school spring spring fever excitement? Yes, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Never make an assumption. We have lots of fun events coming up throughout the school year, so it's exciting. Prom Prom is May twenty.
the life of, of students, the life of um, education. It was um, it's pretty special that there were students who were guiding us to the classrooms they wanted to show us, and telling us about the subjects that excited them, um, and the challenges that they faced, and the challenges they were supporting each other through, and just the things that they identified were, were particularly hard in a way like something in the system that we're not sure what to do with, but we acknowledge that people, other students, peers who don't have a pod, who are struggling with that transition in between places or just whatever's going on, um, that they have a harder time. And that's um, peer mentorship program sounds pretty amazing for that. Um, also, just the students seeing each other. And it really was an invitation for us to see them more and, and deeper that are not as members um, and not as as, 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 as results on a um, data testing. And so that was a um, glad to that visit and I hope to have another more opportunities to get to know these public. Desante, um, deep appreciation for everyone coming tonight. Um, as one of the newest board members, I had a pit in my stomach and didn't sleep last night. I just own the, the realities that everyone's going through right now are really hard, and I appreciate folks um, showing up and voicing your, your, your support, concern, opinions. It's um, incredibly rewarding and gratifying. I'm a mom of a kindergartner at Chautauqua who's super fortunate to be in Ms. Long's class. Um, and can't say enough, you know, wonderful things and sort of first dip in public education around what's available here in the community and that's a testament to you all, teachers, staff, um, and all the buildings who are showing up every day and doing incredible work. So it's hard. Thank you for being here. Thank you for bearing with us. Um, and not sure what else to say. <laughs> members probably have noticed already that I um, pre-write my board remarks because um, I'm not very good at speaking off the cuff, but just so you all know. Um, so I just want to thank everyone uh, who wrote to us throughout this last week and uh, for the district staff that used their valuable and limited time um, these past few days informing us on the real life impacts students will experience from these cuts really appreciate you all taking that time um, and uh, just a friendly reminder to the board that one of our uh, five core principles of school board standards according to WASDA the Washington State School Directors Association is uh, holding the district accountable for student learning and I believe it is our responsibility as a board to deeply question and investigate if the decisions we are making are in the students best interest and how we can best align them with the Align them to the values we have put forth as a district. And I think um, the comments in the letters have uh, done a good job highlighting those values. But um, just to emphasize that um, we, let's see, we. Uh, we promised focused attention to our identified priority equity groups of English language learners, students with disabilities, low-income students, students of color, neurodiverse students, and non-binary kids. I know we're um, facing extremely hard decisions, and any of the decisions that we make are going to have really pretty adverse impacts no matter what. Um, however, I invite my fellow board members to reflect on how we might act today and moving forward to better match our stated values and not only reflect but actively discuss and scrutinize our options and be open to finding solutions together and summoning the effort and imagination that takes.
I think this one works better. Oh, it does. Okay. Um, I'll speak more about the, the budget later in that uh, part of the, uh, of the conversation. But I do remember as a young kid, uh, my parents poring over printed copies of the budget at the dinner table and going to union meetings and having uh, animated conversations over the phone with their peers. They're both teachers here at the high school uh, for nearly all of their career. And this continues to persist today in my own household uh, at the dinner table. <laughs> and it's a, it's a reminder that we are all on the same island and we're in this together. And in the conversations that I was fortunate enough to, uh, to have this week and be present for uh, with a number of the staff, it's also a reminder that <clears throat> all the activities are interlinked. So it's like a giant game of Jenga. You can't just make a change over here without understanding how that propagates through the whole system, which makes this whole thing even more complicated and, and uh, difficult. Uh, so more about budgets later. Uh, I did want to reflect on the trip to McMurray, which was fun, uh, fun for me, because I went to McMurray and it was a Mustang. And maybe just now when I go to McMurray, I don't feel like a student, but it's kind of been a while. <laughs> and I'm not sure many people uh, have that experience that middle school can be so cool and such a place for connection and growth. Uh, I think a lot of us remember it as being kind of a scary spot. Yeah. And uh, I'm just always really excited when I go to all the schools. And this week when I was at McMurray, it was particularly cool to see the students uh, and how they've connected <clears throat> and how they described their growth from the beginning of this year when we returned. It was really awkward and everyone's wearing masks and trying to remember how to socialize. And you know they've changed over the time they're remote and can't remember each other's names. And, I've forgotten how to sit still and all the basic things. And now by spring, they, they were saying that it's just, they're starting to turn the corner. They're excited about being at school in person. And I also have seen that uh, within the school, there's this more understanding of where the kids are and, and trying to meet them where they are and, and helping them develop from that place. And so expectations have, have changed and broadened. And I can see that in the activities of both peer to peer at the student level, but also uh, at the staff level. And so that amount of flexibility is really remarkable and I, I gotta celebrate that. Uh, so thanks to the kids who hosted us and thanks Mr. Allison for, uh, for having us there. All right, I think that covers us for the moment. <clears throat> uh, next up on the item is discussion uh, related to a board policy revision. Right. You'll be presenting these. Uh, so I want to thank, first of all, uh, Board Member Marielle for bringing to our attention uh, an opportunity for more transparency in, in, our, in the process of, in which we uh, essentially ask the Board to approve agreements, uh, the collective bargaining agreements, and that process, and, and, the, and, and questioning that process uh, around bringing, again, bringing more transparency. And so uh, part of some of the conversation and, and, and solution that she brought forward at, at our last meeting when we ratified the SEI, well, when the, we, when the board took action on the SIU contract was the possibility of making a policy revision in policy number 1400, which is meeting conduct, order of business, and quorum. And so Jody, you have it up there. And tonight, um, uh, it is typical for board, uh, for our board directors and part of our protocol when we take action on, on any item, we have a first reading and a second reading, and that is codified in, our, in, in, in this policy 1400. And what we've added in green tonight is language that uh, allows the board to suspend the practice of a first and second reading when taking action on the collective bargaining agreements with Fashion Education Association, Fashion Educational Support Personnel, and Service Employees International Union Local 925. And part of this process is to recognize that the bargaining process is, is quite extensive and, and lengthy, and we recognize the, the hard work that goes into these bargains um, on all sides, the time spent, and there is a certain uh, anxiousness at times uh, around the time that you ratify it and you're wanting the, the board to take action on it. And so it's been uh, working in our practice for the board to take action on the collective bargaining agreement 
because of the extensive work that, the, that each side has done in forming their members, uh, the board being formed uh, all along the way, and sometimes by the mere fact that uh, it, at, at, that, at that stage of the agreement, it can, it, it, it can sometimes be unthinkable that, that we would still be making changes to it since it's been tentatively agreed by, by members of the labor, and then uh, again, support of, uh, and support from the board as well. And so uh, we're offering tonight uh, and before the board to consider, again, this would be a first reading to change this policy. Uh, the board may suspend the practice of a first and second reading and uh, right now it's open up for discussion. Or questions? So how is this different than what is already happening? Which I understand um, is the board just suspending the policy of the first and second meeting. How does inserting this um, change that for some who still have to go through that suspension um, vote followed by um, contract vote? Mm, this, this says that you'd be able to suspend the first, um, the practice of a first and second reading. You'd be able to suspend it and move forward with the first reading. So is there, is, is that the intent of the, of your suggestion? and the language doesn't read that way, or? I just um, don't understand what the, how this, um, how does it change, like you would still have to vote to suspend it? Or no, have... no, you wouldn't have to vote to suspend it. You would not have to vote on policy uh, 13, uh, so like two, so like two, 1320. Yeah, the question is because it says may, um, not must. Right, so it's so. So, so if the board decide, would you know, if the board chair, um, certainly in discussion with any board member, and there was a desire to have a first and second reading, I left it as may to allow that option. Right. I, I would anticipate that the board practice would continue as it, as it has been since I've been here. Um, and then what the policy in, also allows is the forward transparency so that the public knows that this is how bargaining agreements are adopted by the board. And that you know, that, that exception is, is, is possible uh, for bargaining agreements. Um. I remember when we had this discussion, I was under the impression that um, you or somebody in administration was going to talk to the labor leaders to kind of see what um, they thought about, like, the, the, the board practice in general of, of pushing it through. Um, and we're interestingly in a weird uh, place right now <laughs> where this is weirdly relevant. Um, but. Uh, did you by any chance get to talk to labor leaders about yeah, that issue? We have, not, we, have not, we have not talked to labor leaders <laughs> yeah, we about it. whether a first or second reading <laughs> is on their mind. On their mind. No. I, I would be interested to like hear their perspective before we, um, but we have three times adopt it. Yes. So just putting that plug in, I would like to I'd welcome any language you would want to suggest, absolutely. Okay, so, so I, I'm not sure it would necessarily need a, an entirely new policy because this does uh, address board meeting uh, kind of conduct. But if you have the language that you would prefer that you think would make um, better sense, I would love to see that in front of the board. Okay, yeah, and um, I think one point that I raised about the amount of time between um, the ratification by the, uh, by the unions and, um, and parties to the agreement and um, and the vote, the, the reading vote um, by the board, that being defined somewhere, I think that would be helpful. Um, and I'm not sure what the ideal amount of time would be, but I will.
around the first reading of this. So as I hear it, Mario, you're going to offer, provide some language that you think would be more clear and toward the intent that you're thinking? Okay. And I will, right, I'll reach out to our labor groups. Great. The next three policies, uh, as we, so we haven't really had this opportunity as a, as a new board yet. Um, Jody and I typically try to provide the board uh, opportunities to update our, our policies on a somewhat fairly regular basis. Um, through COVID and the pandemic, it has been more irregular than regular. Uh, but we do receive uh, policy revisions from WASDA, as Kelly uh, spoke about WASDA earlier. And those, those policy revisions are essentially identified as essential, uh, encouraged, or optional. And so uh, we focus mostly on the essential policies. And so what you see tonight are three policies for the first read. Um, most of these, all three of these are considered essential from WASDA, uh, and most of them require some actual minor, minor revisions. And so I will go ahead and go through them. So starting with policy 4200, Joey, you have that, they're great. And so this adds language around uh, expectations of visitors, and parents are assured access to their child's classroom. However, uh, as before, and what, are, what we expect, uh, those uh, visits uh, are not expected to disrupt the, the classroom or, or learning activity. So again, it's the, it's, these are some pretty minor revisions, but when they come from WAS, we try to, this is, this is the business part of our meeting. So any questions about this revision? Okay, the next one, 5270, Jody. Okay, you'll see some strike throughs here. And uh, this is essentially our resolution of staff complaints. And uh, typically, um, you know, this policy is encouraged to work through complaints at the kind of one-to-one -one basis. And then there's a procedure that, that we follow when there's a violation of existing district policies or procedures as directly agreed to staff and those procedures in a, in, in a nutshell are essentially working with uh, direct supervision and then appealing any um, you know, decision to myself and then continue to appeal to, to the board and I believe the board has, has had an experience with that um, 5270 procedure and so this one you can see just I think cleans up the language was this provided a, a cleaner version of the, of the language and then also at the very end strikes through that documents, communications, records dealing with the processing of agreements shall be maintained in a separate file, should not be kept in the personal file of the agreed that has not been stricken. So this looks like more like a uh, cleaning up of the language and you can see it was last revised in 2009. So which is pretty, can be pretty common. And the last one, policy 5410 is the addition of Juneteenth, June 19th to our list of federal holidays. State holidays, sorry. Yeah. So, again, three policies that don't really, uh, they're, they're not fairly too compelling, and then um, we have some more work to do on policy 1400. And I expect what we'll see next time at our meeting on the 26th are these uh, four policies in front of the board again, and hopefully we'll be at a place where we can take action on them. All right, uh, thank you for presenting those for discussion. Uh, next up uh, is the decision portion of the meeting. Uh, the first two elements are related to uh, collective bargaining agreements. Uh, and this is related also to uh, the conversation we just had um, about policy number 1400 um, that we would need to suspend in order to take action in the first reading uh, of the decision in, in these two cases, uh, collective bargaining agreements. Um, so do you want to, uh, who's going to present the, the notes before we vote? I will present Amy to present the notes. But I do want to say, you know, typically when we finish bargaining, uh, this is going to be an atypical year. 
Um, when we finish bargaining with uh, any uh, labor group, it again requires extensive out of class time typically for, for staff members and, and time away for principals and other district administrators. Um, and these are very large investments, not only of time, but of trust, of emotion, of passion, um, and an investment of our, of our shared commitments. And so uh, we, we still, uh, I, I believe, should be celebrating many positive things that happened uh, uh, for our district and for our staff in, in the bargaining process. I believe we made some significant improvements around collaboration and, and shared decision making. And even in the midst of, of you know, the challenges that are in front of us, um, I believe there's a lot to be recognized and, um, and, and celebrated with those labor partners that we worked with uh, in DEA and both BESP. So tonight we'll be uh, putting uh, before the board for a first read and, and action in, in this decision part of our, of our, of our meeting this evening. Uh, but Amy's going to work through the uh, the kind of the, the key points for the BEA contract and uh, the BESP contract as well. And typically uh, we've had, and I'm not gonna, you can be put on the spot or not put on the spot, but if you're part of bargaining and that part of that bargaining process and you want to uh, speak about the bargaining process, uh, typically we, we always you know, allow space for, for, for labor leaders if, uh, if they want to uh, make a comment or share anything about their experience with the board tonight as well. So I will you know, open up the mic for any of our, of our labor leaders who participate in the process. But it's not the expectation tonight. So I'll turn it over to Amy. Thank you, Slade. Um, so I am going, as I did with SEIU, I am going to touch on key points, uh, things that are just language clarification. I'm not going to obviously go into it in depth. And I'm crossing my fingers that I maintain battery power on my computer while I do this. Um, so, <laughs> okay, back up. Um, so, first item on the list is um, shared decision making, and the teams work together extensively to develop a matrix that outlines um, how different types of decisions will be made between staff and administration and stakeholders. And I think we all anticipate that it will have a really positive effect on um, clarifying who, how, and when decisions are made that affect different, different parties. Um, we, in vacancies, we did add um, very specifically the right to an interview for open positions for employees who are on the placement contracts. Um, we cleaned up language on involuntary transfers and um, change the word of language around frequency on voluntary transfers, and um, again, included the replacement employees. Uh, travel time mileage clarification, um, updated some rates on emergency classroom coverage, and we again, um, fairly extensively, went back into the language and added detail and around communication and planning for the non-instructional work time. Um, and also detailed the process for, for um, selection of the, the professional learning community leads so that there is staff participation in that process. Um, updated compensation for um, class size overages. And same thing for the special education caseload. Um, and we also created language around our employee educator support team. Um, added some time for kindergarten teachers to administer the walk-ins assessments. Did some language update around some state requirements. Um, salary schedule. For 22-23, there will be a 7% increase over the current year, 23-24 and 24-25. There will be the inflationary adjustments selected by the legislature, plus 1%. Um, national board bonus, currently uh, the state funds national board bonuses for teachers and counselors. We have included a bonus for um, 
psychologists, OTs, PTs, behavior analysts, and SLPs who have achieved um, national certification in their discipline. Uh, we added some days of compensation for school social workers and ELL teachers. And we also have provided for um, ferry commuters to receive uh, a certain number of, of um, ferry tickets per month, depending on whether or not you're committing by car or, or walking across. But we will help defray the cost of commuting from Seattle to Tacoma or South. Um, supplemental pay rate we updated, we updated substitute pay, and then the duration is a three-year duration from September of this year through August of 2025, and then in addition to that, there's just a lot of clarifications and numbers, et cetera. Any questions to that very quick um, interlaced? I just have one quick question. The national board stipends, are those one time when it's achieved or is it an annual stipend for whole new cert? Okay, great. Thanks. Can you remind us how many um, staff are involved in this um, in this particular contract and what the um, the pay increases, what that will what that will amount to in total? Um, the next the, budget. Okay, I always think an FTE, not headcount, so I'm sorry, but the, the current FTE at the end of this year is I believe 94 FTE. And I'm gonna let Kay speak to the, the overall cost. Well, after the staffing reductions, is that, sorry. We implemented staffing reductions. I did a comparison between last year and this year. For BEA, it's gonna be about 645,000 more. That's with the reductions that we have put in the system for next year. Because I only have that to work with, so. Okay. That's only salary, that does not include benefit cost. Okay, that's just salary. Benefits I could separate from classified and certified. Um, benefits are going about 331,000. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's an increase over mm -hmm. the next one? Okay. Other questions for the um, I'm so happy to see the ferry, um, the ferry come in because that is how we are yeah. going to get we are going to get staff right, from all file. I mean, we obviously love all of you. We want to help you with your commuting. We want to help you commute, but also get staff of color. It, it's so I'm I'm so thankful we got some here. Are there any, yeah, I was gonna say, are there any uh, labor leaders who? I'll hand it to you. I just didn't know if you guys, I wanted to make sure that you knew that that 7%, 5.5 of it is the IPD, right? Okay. Yeah, can you raise your hand or stand up so we can keep your mind Anybody else want to speak to the contract at all? The negotiations? Wait, I'll just say from here um, that this is a multi-day process. It's um, we interview each of our members one-on-one. -on -one. We talk to them about their concerns. We come together with the whole admin team. I'm um, the district lawyer, and we have a WEA, so a state union rep in the room. It's a knockdown drag out. There's back and forth, fabulous conversations. We can be miles apart and we come together, and it's a super powerful experience. And this year, more than any other slate, I felt like you were super present in the room, and I felt like it built trust between us. And then all this that happened right afterwards is a huge setback because we get these things for our members and everyone's excited, and then we have members that whose pay is being cut by 20% and programs are being lost. And it's not transparent in the room, and we've gotta fix it. And so I'm, I'm a solutions person, I care about everybody in this district, don't wanna rip anybody apart, but we have to do better. So just, that was, it was a wonderful bargain, super positive, 
and then this. So we just got to keep going. One of the things that we've come a long way in, in our bargaining, um, and, and not far along, not far enough yet, is the honesty that we bring to the table. And um, you know, as the relationships have been developing over the last four years, at least my four years, I feel like that honesty has been improving. And I appreciate the vulnerability that we both share, um, the willingness to say when something's not working, uh, and the accountability that we bring to each other, um, and really become the learning organization that we really are. Because we're about student learning, we're about adult learning. Uh, so uh, I, I just appreciate everything you said. And um, and if you don't know, uh, Lisa is truly like the advocate for our district um, throughout this, I'm gonna share something. So th during this process, she has, you know, has been there for me. So, and I appreciate that, so. All right. Um, Thank you. And so uh, next, uh, we would like to go ahead and I'm going to, again, similar to the SEIU contract, I'm going to be recommending that the board suspend uh, use policy, uh, take action on policy 1320, the suspension of policy, in particular policy number 1400, and then take action on policy 1400 and approve the a collective bargaining agreement between Bashan Island School District, Bashan Education Association from 2022 through 2025. All right, thanks, Lee. Uh, is there a motion uh, for that action? So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Uh, thank you, Zabet. Um, all right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. You know, unanimous, all right. You're not? All right, thank you. All right, congratulations. Thank you, thanks for the hard work. So, so. Sorry, I'm gonna yeah. pull a policy and walk on you. You just approved policy 1320 right. to suspend 1400. Now you're going to take action on the, poli on the CBA. <laughs> Talk about jumping the gun. All right, is there a motion to take action on uh, the approval of the collective bargaining agreement? Second, all in favor? Aye. Aye. All right, now, well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you for everyone, it's very hard work. Thank you, yeah, we'll get it right the next time, which happens right now. Uh, the next up is the collective bargaining agreement uh, summary between um, Bathroom Educational Support Personnel, BESP, and the district. And uh, Amy, would you uh, do the same thing? Yeah, we'll do so. Um, so again, we had a number of items that were clarifications and cleanups. Um, we added to the language defining what under what conditions the BESP member may provide emergency classroom coverage if we cannot find a certified staff, staff, staff member. Um, we clarified new hire information. We tackled the day before Thanksgiving early release of students and how we can adjust the time for our classified staff to accommodate the students do. I agree with that. <laughs> um, we defined criteria for extra pay for attending district committee meetings and it, you know, looked at which caps the individuals would be wearing at different committees and, and which pay is appropriate for the hat they're wearing, whether it's a union representative or a staff member. Uh, we also allowed for BESP participation in the development of school-wide discipline standards, since their member certainly has a common interest in the discipline processes within the schools. Um, updated some timing around the prior school training activities. We added June to this paid holiday. Um, did another update to timesheet language. Um, Change language to comply with the paid, paid family and medical leave. Uh, clarification on the posting and application processing for different positions. Change the notification period for mid year layoffs from 30 days to 60 days. Again, updates some language around medical benefits to reflect the current system. Um, we added language that reflects the language that we have with the EA 
to uh, how we can provide district support for the ESP members who are interested in becoming certified in high needs endorsement areas, um, which is really something we're pretty excited about being able to do. Uh, we changed the professional development to monies that are, are available to members from a prorated $275 to $300 per individual, regardless of FTE, and then clarify the language around how those funds can be used. Uh, another language update around new hires and checklists. Um, added language that an absence related to an injury caused by a student not be charged the employee sick leave. Um, update our mediation for our grievance process to include mediation. Uh, duration is again three years, September 2022 through August 2025. We have reopener language, um, and in terms of compensation, we made initial one time adjustments to positions that were below level three in our competitive districts, and then once that was done, we established an increase of 7% inclusive, inclusive of IPE, and then uh, again, inflation factor plus 1% in the following two years. I have the same question as before. FTEN. With the reductions and the step increases, the raises came to about 184 for the ESD. How many FTE are represented? Oh, uh, I know, and I just looked at it earlier, really, I need to pull it up. And that will be very different from headcount, right? Yes, yes. very, very different. Yes. Colby, do you know? I think our, I think our headcount is yeah. 39. Great, thank you. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? going through the list because I think a lot of times we focus on like what did you get as a raise and that's the highlight but there's so many things in here that are really that actually make the job there's more to it than just you know getting the paycheck from the district office and so I, it's really it's really good to hear all in both, in both cases it's really, so thanks for going over all of it well, I, I will tell you in bargaining we spend days on everything else and usually compensation is a total of maybe a day. And so most of what we're bargaining is all of the other yeah. Are there any features of, uh, of this contract and maybe um, both contracts uh, that you think were particularly reflective of um, a greater interest and awareness around the um, equity priorities that are being built into the strategic plan and just into sort of the culture of, of the district? Um, I think in the BEA contract, the decision making matrix. Is, is really an opportunity for a lot more voice to be involved in, in the decisions that are happening in the district. Um, I also think that the leader yeah. is, is going to be significant for us in terms of attracting and retaining staff um, over time because we do have more and more staff community. Um, I think actually, interestingly, the BDSP being part of the discipline planning process in the buildings is really significant as well because they are in the front lines with some of our um, most challenging students and some of these students who are frequently part of some educational justice and so their voice in that process I think is really significant. I also believe the, uh, the increased enhancements for professional development uh, is a significant move towards uh, seeing our classified staff as true professionals uh, and, and, and experts in their practice. Any more questions? Anybody wanna? I was just about to say, right, so uh, uh, if, you would, if, if you would please either raise your hand or stand up, we would like to recognize those members of our labor leader group. <laughs> And that's the last place they actually want to be, um, sitting at the bargaining table. And so thank you very much for your time and commitment. And if any of you would like to speak, I'd certainly um, share the mic where you can stand I think, up. I think we definitely share a visual um, with BEA that it definitely, collectively, this process this year 
I agree. Um, throughout being at the table for quite a few years now, I totally agree with that, that it felt really solid and the process felt mutual. And we, as a team, were like, wow, this is awesome. This feels like how things are supposed to be done. Um, and so I think we're close. Um, obviously, within 24 hours of ratification of our contract, getting uh, some new news um, in terms of the rifts uh, was shocking. Um, and so moving forward, less shock and more collectiveness would be awesome. Um, but yeah. I agree. Thank you, Kobe. Yeah. Um, and uh, with that, uh, once again, uh, we did kind of a practice round with VEA, so we'll, I'm going to be take, uh, recommending the board take action on policy 1320 suspension of a policy to approve uh, suspending the uh, first and second read on our passing uh, or approval of the CBA between VISD and VESP. And then after that, I would recommend that the board take action on approval, final approval of that uh, contract between VSP and VISD for 22, uh, 2022 through 2025. Thanks, Lady. <laughs> All right, is there a um, motion on the floor? Move to suspend policy for 1400. <laughs> 1400. Uh, to be able to take action on the contract with you. Is there a second? No second. All right, thank you. All in favor? Aye. 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 Great. Now we can take action. Is there a motion on the floor to a, to approve the collective bargaining agreement between the ESP and VISD? <laughs> you need to, uh, someone needs to make a motion to approve it and then someone else will second it. All right, are you all in moves? Seconds. <laughs> all right, thank you. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you and congratulations. <laughs> all right, next up is resolution 800. Pass the microphone back to. Great. Uh, thank you, board, and uh, thank you, everybody, again, uh, for coming tonight and showing your support and passion for the work we do in support of our kids. Um, uh, Zvet, I can tell you that I haven't been getting any hugs. Um, and uh, if uh, Vanessa's here, if Vanessa's here, I can guarantee you that I will be in the paper. Um, but uh, that being said, in, in all honesty, uh, you know, we're, we're not there yet. Um, and I, I know we like to say that with our, with our, with our students and encouragement that we, again, are a learning organization. Uh, we've come a long way in our processes and um, I'll share with you, even when I feel like we've been making progress, even on our own budgeting, you know, work with, uh, with, with Mr. Sullivan and, and Kay and, and Amy and our building admin and trying to get the uh, meetings sooner and information sooner. Uh, we still arrived at a place that was uh, that put us in a and put put us in a difficult position and and is still keeping us in a difficult position. But I'm hard to see the the passion tonight. And once again, thank you for all of those who spoke tonight. Um, the what you've been saying to us, the messages that you've been sending through email, um, I can tell you wholeheartedly that I've been taking them into full consideration, and I know each of our our board members has as well. Uh, I'm, I'm proud of the work, as Zabed has said, uh, the work that we've been doing in the last week um, in terms of trying to get as much information out um, and collecting you know, feedback, and we've been able to make some significant changes uh, to some of those initial decisions. Uh, but I'd like to just start tonight with kind of a recap of, of our process. Um, you know, Mid-April, um, we know that we typically see the legislative session uh, end and we'll get a, a budgeting report from our expenditures and re our, our revenues from, from the state and what we call an F203 report. Um, and sometimes that will happen during negotiations. Sometimes negotiations will, will be extended into May and sometimes into June. And sometimes uh, we've seen negotiations extend into August and September and even October. Um, uh, we also completed our enrollment projections uh, at that, you know, in advance of that, and so understanding our enrollment projections, our MSOC costs, F203, 
um, some calculations regarding inflation and understanding the impacts from, from special services, um, we begin to come to a, an idea of, of what our budget is going to look like for next year. And every year the, the board has to approve uh, a balanced budget that they, I guess, that they vote on in June and then submit to, to ESD, who then submits it to OSPI. And so uh, during this process, the, the struggles that, um, you know, that we are currently under, um, we are projecting a lower enrollment, um, kind of as we discussed at the fire, former board meeting, from currently we're at 1456, we will be going down to, to 1425. And we're, we're conservative because we just don't know. Um, over the course of the last three years, we've been seeing uh, yearly drops in enrollment in King County between 18 and 20,000 uh, students. And so regionally, uh, we are experiencing a, a decrease in enrollment uh, in schools, uh, particularly in kindergartners. Um, and that is, now we've seen three years where we have three classes at our, at our schools where we had kindergarten classes come in at around 60 students. And so we're moving from a kind of from a five class, four class to now a, a, a three class, um, you know, three three teacher classroom uh, at most of our levels at, at the lower grades. Um, we also are seeing the prototypical funding model, and I think it might have been Vanessa who spoke about McCleary, um, but the those decisions made some steps in the right direction, um, but they really did not fix some of the permanent. Um, you know, systems that severely undercut districts' ability to fully fund the educators that we that we need, that we know we need in, in, in front of our students. And so, um, you know, in short, we, we've arrived at, a, at, a, at an impasse where a week ago we were looking at a deficit of approximately 1.3 million. And since then, uh, in our meetings and our conversations, and Kay and, and Matt and Amy working together, uh, we've identified some other areas in, with MSOX to take away some of the the, the burden uh, that we that uh, that we are are experiencing, and we've been able to. We just shared with um, with labor leaders yesterday that we were able to uh, find capacity and restore the original cut that was going to be happening to the school psych. So the school psych will now have two full school psychs. I, I appreciate it. it feels just like it's crushing news to me, folks. So, um, but but we're we're we are working hard and we're working together, uh, which uh, I believe that was can echo. That was something that echoed throughout everybody's statements. This idea of working together. Um, we were also uh, able to um, be creative and offset some costs in our general funds uh, from some again some capital projects and tech projects to. Uh, fully fund that grounds maintenance person, and so they are restored to 1.0 as well. Um, and, it, and it really was, um, you know, kind of part of a throwing everything on the table to to, to under, understand uh, where possibilities could be. Uh, but if you know uh, Jackie, I'm going to say the name Jackie Merrill at the high school, uh, our office manager there, she is a, uh, a rock star and wears a cape daily. Um, and in support of those teachers and all the staff of the VHS. So that office manager has been um, filled to 1.0 um, per hour we're going to be cut, and that was going to be very difficult. And then uh, last but not least, I was able to meet with our uh, with our new nurse, um, and Sarah, Sarah, is she still here? She left. Oh, yeah, there, there you go. So I was able to, uh, you know, get a healthy dose of Sarah Day yesterday. and. and, 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 and You know, Sarah and I, uh, uh, she just kept me honest, you know, for the last couple of years, and so, um, so I appreciate that, and I appreciate you showing up, uh, you know, with uh, Liz and Amy Nelson. Um, it's an excellent staff, and Ann was, Ann, are you here too? Maybe she, I know she was, I saw her, so, um, but anyway, we were able to, uh, again, find uh, capacity and resources to restore our, our, our nursing program back to its current staffing level. The, what you see tonight um, is uh, different than what you saw on, on Thursday 
And so, Jody, if you could bring the reduction, not that one, but the other one, the reduction plan. Thank you. So, um, I know, I was just about to ask the same thing. If you could kind of give a swipe, or there you go. So what we're reducing now is 916,900, so it's on the other page. And so you'll see um, uh, nothing has changed in the food service uh, hours. Um, those positions, uh, once again, are going back to where that, 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 that staffing is going to go back to pre-COVID levels, 2018-19 uh, levels, and that um, is intended to reflect the meal service. We will no longer be doing free meals. Uh, at least that's what we're being told by the, by the state and the feds. And certainly if that changes, then we would uh, increase staffing. And so if the board uh, may or may not remember, we consider a food service and enterprise production, an uh, inter enterprise program where as service increases, we increase staffing, and as service decreases, we decrease staffing. And so um, right now we're budgeting for levels closer to the 2018-19 uh, staffing levels. Um, in facilities, uh, once again, uh, you'll see a custodian there, uh, and then moving to the, the district, we have added uh, point two of an athletic director that was not currently on the prior sheet. And we are have also odd added uh, some time away from the district office uh, for one of our staff in the district office. So a reduction in hours there. And then um, as well as uh, more reduction in, uh, so no, that's actually front office. And then we add, what we added was some student services support reduction in hours around student services support in our, in our main office. And then the communication coordinator has not changed. Uh, that uh, position is identified as a cut. Correct, yep. doesn't, doesn't retain it at, at any level. It's possible that there's a grant uh, that Stephanie and John have been working on and that grant will um, open up, and I don't believe it's opened up yet, and then we'll put in that grant, but it, the, the indication that Stephanie has given me is that we'll know soon if that grant is approved, so potentially early June, mid-June, we may know uh, what happens with that funding. And then uh, the COVID coordinator, uh, you can see there's no identified money but there, but what we're doing is identifying just um, positions that are no longer with us. Um, and, but, but that position, as we know, as I just learned, could be funded by Return to Learn again, and that was a pass-through. So then in student services, uh, you'll see that there's a paraeducator uh, at that, and that was a one year only this year. Um, and so that position, uh, it, what we, we, we budget for, for special services, our student services. Uh, some of it is, is forecasted and some of it is based on need. And so it looks like you have something to. Uh, that actually doesn't reflect any currently employed individual. Right. We have, we have a, a, a position that is sitting as a tentative open and it's not reflected in the paper. Right. The paraeducator. You want to repeat that, Amy? I don't think you, you might have to speak a little bit closer. Sorry, um, that was a position that was a tentative opening that we have decided not to fill, but that's not impacting anybody who's currently employed. But it's impacting all of those other members. Right. Still. <laughs> sure. uh, then moving forward, the OT position, uh, a reduction of point two there, that hasn't changed. At LINK, we've identified uh, a point two teaching position, and so that is uh, recently added to, to LINK. If enrollment increases there, again, we'll have capacity to uh, bring that teaching position back to a 1.0. And then at VHS, 
uh, we have the 0.5 CTE, the 0.2 Math, 0.2 Science, and 0.2 Art, and 0.2 English, and these are mostly due to uh, lower enrollment. As we know, Danny, uh, oh, well, Danny, I've always said Danny, the, the high school started off with uh, a, a, a lower enrollment than grew, uh, and then we funded positions, 7.8 positions to 1.0, we added staffing there, and then we saw 39, uh, 39? Yeah, you know, we saw 39 uh, students drop from the high school, most of them moving to Student Link. But what that means is that then we increase Student Link staffing, uh, which means we now have double staffing for some of those, so for some of those students. Um, because once we add staffing uh, into a classroom, as you may imagine, it's not, if we send us, two students to student link, we, we're not gonna reduce a section of English or a section of art. Um, so um, that's something that I hope to take a look at in a, a sustainability plan is how do we look at when enrollment shifts over to link. Um, that's, that's a problem that we absolutely have to, to solve moving forward. At McMurray, uh, we have a point two reduction in art, point two in French and point two in music, though those were identified. Uh, last time and there's been uh, drops of, enroll of enrollment or forecasting in those electives. And then at CES, we have the classroom teacher 1.0, once again due to a drop in enrollment. Then we have a point four specialist. There was a point two specialist on the prior iteration of this agreement. Point two has been added. And those specialists are the Spanish specialists and music specialists. Library, Library specialists, sorry. Thank you. And then we have the uh, kind of, again, the identification of the non continuing sub, and then the math support coordinator to general para, that was on the last one, and then the ELL para, which is also on the last one. And the ELL para was uh, added staffing this year uh, to meet the need. And once again, we'll be in that position next year when we have to evaluate the grant funding, evaluate the student population. Uh, ELL student population, I believe, is decreasing uh, currently at the elementary building. I see a head shake from Stephanie. So once again, we have to uh, evaluate what is the you know the appropriate staffing level for the amount of, of students that will be coming in at Chautauqua who receive ELL services? So I've, I've gone through just basically the the list of reductions, and uh, this is a time for discussion, um, questions, uh, ideas, or other solutions. Um, And those have been amazing, but uh, once again, kind of when we think about moving forward, is that something that we can, uh, um, you know, afford? And we prioritized other positions in, in front of a, of, a, of the uh, of the basically the permanent sub. But even right now, our permanent subs are in permanent positions. So, um, you know, serving our, our, our kids and helping out. Um, so um, they've become really part of our, our staff and our family. Which hopefully we'll be able to get to see them back in, in other positions. Can you explain what happens if the moment goes up beyond what we expect or what happens if the moment is actually lower? Um, I don't want to think about the lower part of that. But it is certainly in the realm of thinking. Um, and so, you know, really when Kay and, and Matt go, go to the buildings and work with the principals and their office managers uh, in terms of looking at, you know, enrollment for next year, they're, they're pretty accurate about, you know, what to, what to expect. And then, of course, we're, we make a conservative, uh, you know, 
we take a conservative approach after that. We don't go in at 100% of what we're of what we're predicting, and so um, we don't anticipate going under. And one of the things that's happened during the pandemic that we've seen in other districts is significant enrollment loss, um, especially at the younger grades. And we saw what I believe, you know, during the pandemic, something around a three to five percent reduction when other districts uh, were, you know, anywhere between ten and fifteen percent. And so that speaks a lot to our the experience we have on the island, and uh, and again, all that experience comes from the the talent that we that we have in front of our kids. And so uh, we are optimistic. Um, I can't help but be optimistic because of, again, those who I see in this room um, who, again, are in front of our kids. And those kids go home and tell their parents what happened during the day. And then those parents, you know, when they're having coffee or whatever with, the, with their friends, they tell their friends. And I think it creates, um, you know, hopefully a particular buzz about being here in, in our school district. And so. If we get more students, uh, typically a, an extra FTE is around $12,000. And so if we have 10 extra students, uh, that would equal $120,000. And of course, um, you can kind of do the, do the math if we had 20 or, or 30 extra students. And so what happens then, and what would be part of our process would be to bring staff and everybody together and go, okay, uh, what set of priorities, you know, uh, let's go back and look at you know, what, we, what we took away what makes sense in terms of the enrollment, and then um, what makes the most sense in terms of putting services back? So, what was the answer to the first part about it's lower? If it's lower, uh, depending on our fund balance situation, depending on how we're able to meet payroll, uh, we we we'll probably take a look at it, probably between five and other five to ten other factors, I imagine. Uh, we would let Kay and Mac and, and Amy kind of take the lead, but we would be in a position where we'd have to probably reduce uh, staffing or reduce extracurricular activities. We would start making some deeper, deeper cuts. to review staffing reduction options, um, using enrollment, student course preferences, and operational needs. And I'm hearing a lot about the enrollment and like um, interest in, I feel like with a lot of the electives, what I heard is, oh, you know, for example, band um, had declining students wanting to, wanting to go in, so that's why that's on the chopping block. But um, I'm sure, you all read the letter that was really compelling that really spelled out um, how band is really important and how combining those classes um, isn't going to work very well. And um, in one of our one of the other meetings, they also talked about how band is really important for building community, like a sense of identity um, in McMurray. So basically, the the question I have is: Is there a way? to switch like a core elective for a different elective or is it maybe this is too late now but like so um so the the question is kind of multifaceted right so timing and then um how do we identify which elective and prioritize which elective so, um, you know, Greg's here, so I can always let him speak. But right now, uh, enrollment for music forecast is 11 students in sixth grade band. And so to run a class of 11 students um, is really difficult on the, on the system. And so, um, you know, unfortunately, even, you know, I mean, because I'm a, I'm a music person, um, if we had uh, surplus funding, or if we had extra funding, then we would we would fund a class of 11 students. 
uh, it's very hard, difficult for us to sustain classes when it's uh, very low enrollment in that class or lower forecasting. And then in terms of timing, uh, that would be correct. You know, we've we've worked through the staffing changes and communication with impacted staff, and to make any changes tonight would be blind. I mean, I'll just say would be a surprise to any other impacted staff members. Would, but it's a good question. Something out having been through this process um, a number of times over a number of years, one of the things that happens tomorrow, Monday, is that we do turn to how do we continue to work on solving this. Tonight is not a be all end all. We are up against some deadlines that we have no flexibility around. Tomorrow is, is a statutory deadline with our certified staff. And then we have contracted deadlines with our classified staff coming on June 1st and June 15th. So we have to take what we believe to be, at this point, necessary action by tomorrow related to our certified staff. That doesn't mean that we're not continuing to problem solve. Um, so our focus turns to how do we continue to problem solve and start restoring as we can. Um, but but because of these deadlines we have, that's why we're kind of in the position we need to take some action because we can't realize that we need to do something next Wednesday because next Wednesday we can't. So I don't know if that helps. Yeah, that does help. Um, my other... No, I was just gonna ask, I, I feel like I, I just have too many dates in my head. What is the, when, what is the time when, the, when we actually are saying, this is the, this is the budget. Oh, the budget. The budget. Just the budget. Like when, like, because I realize, like, these are like. Right. The notices are going. Yeah, no, no, no. I can touch the whole budget. I'm talking about the whole thing. Like, I, like these, the drift notices are, are going out. I get that. But then we'll keep working, we'll keep working, keep working, and. We have to have the budget to the state by July 1st. It has to get to the ESB yeah. by then and get approved. The one thing you need to remember is we have capacity built into the budget of a million dollars. So what that means, if we get any additional funding, we have room to be able to take that funding in and then spend it. So if we do come up with a grant that can save programs or save positions, we have the ability in our budget to absorb it and be able to pay that. Yep. Okay. But those budget documents will come to the board on the 26th. So expenditures, revenues, and staffing, those parts of the budget will come to the board on the 26th. And then we'll, we'll determine whether the meeting on the 26th will be a first read, but it may be the June 9th meeting as a first read. We haven't made the, the decision, so I don't have a recommendation. Okay, so I really don't know how this next thing is going to come out, um, but <laughs> uh, I'm, I've obviously been racking my brain. I'm a processor. I've been hearing all the different solutions throughout this week, um, and I think I, I'm really interested in hearing what the other board members think about the, the, the the kind of uh, echoes in the, in the in the streets about possibly freezing raises of admin staff. Um, is that still like Toby? Is that something within the power of board to do still or not? I don't know what our technical flexibility is there. Um, I think that might be helpful to know what our actual flexibility is there. That's a good question. I don't know. I, I would say, regardless of the, of the technical um, realities, uh, and I've contemplated the, the same question that's come up a number of times, um, the notion of salary freezes, and it was even presented uh, in, a, in a labor conversation for those who were represented. The issue is it doesn't really solve the problem. It kicks the can down the road, and and then we're faced with uh, with the same struggle later. 
and sort of I think from my perspective the, the call to action is to is to look forward to take the spirit of collaboration that we really you know finally captured in the in the uh, collective bargaining agreement conversations and negotiation and keep that spirit moving forward so we can we can solve it and so you know regardless of the salary freezes which would only take into account you know a, a fraction of the uh, of the deficit it uh, it doesn't solve the problem so I'm not sure that that's and that, that's kind of where I arrived on that if you're putting it on the spot of how I thought about it um, but it's a good example of like you know all these questions have come up and you know we've been chewing on it. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Um, I need to understand a little bit more about what the deficit is and what this does to it. Um, but I think it's definitely something to consider. Um, it is seemingly within our power, kicking the can down the road, suspending. A lot of what we're doing tonight is um, because we're compelled by statute um, to offer the notifications. Um, but there's this so, but it'll be okay in the end, right? We'll find solutions and miracles and luck and all that. Um, and I don't know how okay it might be, but, um, but I hope we can all bring, we can bring our all and keep that spirit of collaboration alive. Um, but I, I think, yeah, oh, a solution that we're looking at right now is cutting a whole bunch of hours. Well, Callie just said there's a solution that has been kind of put out there. And that's something we need to talk about. Mm. And it's not something that. Um, <laughs> I mean, stepping back from something that we did um, approve, but if that is within our power, and if that's something that can address what feels like there are crisis elements to this, not just if it's stress in the moment, but it'll be okay, I just don't get that. There are no guarantees. What we're signing off right now is. Maybe losing people. Losing people. Yeah. What 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 is kind of the message of the sense? And um, maybe what we have to do, but there are other things that we could do. But. Um, I have been I, I, same thing. I've been thinking about it a lot, um, and I I don't really know how I really feel about it because I I don't. Um, I just what I, what I what I what I don't want us to get into is 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 taking from the future because I feel like that is is gonna is it's just not gonna help us in the long term and I'm and I'm anxious about doing that for any position at, at any 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 group um, I mean we can talk for sure we can talk about it but I but I'm very I'm hesitant. To, to do it, I, that's where I'm landing on it at this moment. Um, so. Yeah, I've absolutely thought about it as well, um, and contemplated. I'm not going to math full disclosure. I've contemplated potential uh, shifts or changes. I'll be honest. At 9:15 on the night we need to approve this, it's a little hard to wrap my head around how we sort of come to that conclusion right away. Um, I think. Understanding sort of if there's a proposal on the table that you have sort of mapped out, and uh, I, I'm, I don't have enough information to understand sort of impact across the board. And no, no decision is easy, and no decision is a good decision. Um, no, there are good decisions. And so yeah. I'd say one thing that uh, relates to the timing of any decision is we have to make a decision tonight around. Um, Riffs of represented employees. Uh, we still have the flexibility later to, and it's an awful situation. You don't want to tell someone uh, that their position is getting reduced, removed, and then later say, "Oh, sorry, you know, we'd like you back." Um, but we we can't uh, we can't wait, and maybe a solution, a creative thinking solution like that, could be part of a of a solution moving forward because we don't have the same timeline constraints to contemplate that particular uh, question. Uh, so that could be, you know, a, a lever that we consider that doesn't have to happen tonight. It's 
terms of what does have to happen tonight, though, is there any consideration that um, directors have given to? Um, Can she have the mic? Okay. Thank you. That that that's really We have to make decisions around to the staff. This is different tier, different types of, of staff with classified um, and other other uh, So um, we're making a package decision so that we don't have to do this again for us by staff and then um, I see our new position. So um, We're making a wholesale decision, but we, we only have to make a partial decision with regard and with respect to the uh, certified certificated positions. Um, if there is any flexibility that would either break into some of those other staff areas or could be addressed by contemplating solutions that are potentially partial, um, but kind of could have an impact on the decision tonight, I think it's worth spending a little more time on. Um, but if that's not something anyone has a proposal for right now, then basically what's in front of us uh, is what you're saying, Toby. Uh, was there anything else, Kelly, you wanted to? Yeah, just let me quickly jump in here. Um, in terms of what you just talked about, in terms of partial reduction, we have communicated to labor leaders that there are no further changes to this, only to the restoration. So I don't know if that makes sense to the board, uh, but we are not anticipating any changes. If the board uh, moves forward with only partial approval or only approving the certificate of staff, um, that's going to send um, you know folks back to the table to continue working. Um, but if it, if that work changes, who needs to be communicated with? with any additions in terms of like if this board wants to substitute one of these for a different position, that's going to dramatically impact um, the staff because we've been very intentional of who we communicate with and who's being impacted. So I would not recommend to this board that you make any changes to this right now or only partially do it uh, only because of the agreements that are in communication that's currently in place and the potential that will happen that that unfortunate communication circumstances could happen down the road if uh, the board continues to um, look at potential places and places and could be if they are substituted and then we have to change who we have communicated with. Uh, we've made commitments right now to any changes would be uh, restorations from any of these positions currently. So similar to the ones that I uh, pointed to earlier, those four positions. Uh, okay, wait, so just to just to translate, clarify uh, what you just said, did you just say, um, the way I understood what you just said is, um, like all the, all the classified and the certified people uh, or positions uh, that are on here have been communicated out. So if we were to only approve the certified, they're certificated, which is the deadline for uh, 515, the, the classified is deadline of the 1st of June. If we were to mix something up or, or potentially add, I, I wouldn't imagine adding someone, but <laughs> taking somebody away would, was my intention, not, <laughs> not adding a different person. Um, but I hear what you're saying. If we did, if we were to add a different uh, position, then that would create a bit of a pickle because we've already commuted out and said that there's not going to be any changes. But if the changes were to eliminate something because we saved 80K in freezes, that would just be 80K less of classified, right? Yeah. <laughs> or um, Okay, so just thinking out loud here. <laughs> um, the other thing, so I know that it's really, obviously, freezing raises is not popular. Um, I also heard a lot in, um, and I'm sure Toby and whoever else was, uh, watched the videos um, of the budget meeting that uh, a big sentiment that 
it, we're being noted like we also don't want to balance balance the budget. Um, like a lot of this is directly going to impact our priority equity groups. Um, so if we can balance the budget in any other way, I I mean I again that's why I'm taking the time right now to say that. Those are also not popular decisions. You know what I'm saying? Like they're also not very popular. So I think if it is within our power to freeze, um, and we could also swap, reinstate the raises, right? Like it's the same. In my mind, I don't see the difference of freezing a raise and then walking it back and then reinstating it, or doing a rip and then uh, reinstating it. For, yeah, because the other people, because unfortunately the admins don't have labor here. Um, so, so there's that, and then, um, if we, I mean, so do I just be like, I move that we free the races? But I mean, then we have to select which, and then we that suddenly, yeah, I mean, I don't know if that could happen tonight, but I feel like it's within the board's power to make that decision and then, like um, like Amy said, move move forward and then find the solutions and then, yes. like, if that was a real option that the board decides now, we could then, okay, tomorrow, we still we still send out the RIF notices or whatever, but then maybe there's a little bit more room. That's just my thing. I I don't know if that's even like a thing. Um, yes, yes, it's a thing. Yes. So if you make yeah. the decision on the package tonight, you have the flexibility down the road both to examine uh, salaries of non-represented employees and you have the op option to read them. To reinstate any of the changes that were made tonight. Okay. Those decisions don't have to Okay, got it. Um, then the other thing that I would just like to bring up, um, the other like solution that I would like to, for the record, be on the table, is um, if not freezing races, um, having Matt or Kay look into like what a furlough would look like for the most highly paid admin staff. Five days, seven day. I think I heard uh, in also one of the meetings, um, Slade, this may have been a misunderstanding. I'm not sure if this is what you were saying, but I thought I heard you said we budgeted 218K for 7.5 days of subs. Is that right? Something like that. 225K for substitutes. For substitutes. Is that? So I'm thinking I would like love for um, our finance people to do the math for 7.5 days of a furlough. And if that comes out to that amount, if that would come out for the same amount or not. I'm not following you. So, so a furlough is unpaid time off. Okay. So, um, so, so if we budgeted around 220k for paying substitutes for seven and a half days, what are we? What is seven and a half days for some of the admin to not work? I'm not seeing the connection. So it's. The average, I'm just the average, saying. Yeah, yeah, average, I wonder if the, um, the average. The average. Amount yeah, the average. Is uh, VDA member. Uh, that, that takes us up to the seven and a half days during the year. And so we budget $250,000 to cover substitute costs for VA members. That's actually all, all employees. Oh, all employees, sorry, all employees. Maybe I need the mic. And so I don't understand the connection between admin furloughing and the amount of funding that we're allocating or budgeting for substitutes. I just didn't understand the connection yeah. between the so, yeah, substitutes. So, so. That probably was not a connection. <laughs> 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 so, 
Okay, so but, no connection, but but, but but you're making a suggestion to furlough admin. Yes, okay. I would love to go to those numbers as well. Okay. Just possible. Sure. And then, um, can I ask why you um, are targeting the administrative salaries and my salary? Um, I could. I wouldn't put it that way, please. I really wouldn't. And I think the same thing, like, all of this is super personal. I don't want it to be like a, a personal thing. Um, but you, we could also ask, why are we targeting our priorities? <laughs> So I'll just share like, so for my, my principal, uh, since I began as a superintendent here at this, you know, in the district was to ensure that all groups, um, that we live by the principle that we, we attract and retain high quality staff. And um, the staff that are in front of our students, the staff that are, that support those students are equally uh, and critical and important, and I think are deserving of the salaries uh, that they receive. If we began to um, contemplate reducing administrative staff, um, I believe the board would be faced with um, some difficult decisions because if you made decisions that um, impacted leadership's desire to work here, similarly to teaching positions to work here, similarly to classified positions, similar to custodial positions. When we don't support them and value them uh, through compensation, similarly across other groups, uh, you, will, you will find that, again, the message that we hear that we will not see those uh, people stay here. And this community expects uh, high quality education uh, in front of every, you know, in front of their kids, and high quality support, and they expect a a talented group of administrators. Um, and our administrators, uh, time and time again, um, have come through and um, receive e extreme support from their staff and and our community. And what you're suggesting, and I know it's just an idea right now. Um, but you will, um, I'm afraid that you're going to see top quality leaders uh, leave the district and when you don't have quality leadership, the impacts of that are perilous. Um, and so, um, That is, yes, we have building administrators who are currently compensated, a building administrator who is currently compensated less than the people who they supervise. Um, I understand there are inequalities and I think it's a fair question. Um, I don't believe our system can withstand the, uh, what, you're, what you're recommending. Of course you don't. Thanks, Mike. Yeah, um, I know that we've had um, some good conversations about this and, um, and, and yeah, I've, um, I've heard, I've heard that, um, we want to retain, we want to retain our staff. Um, and I think when, when that was brought up another time, oh, the other thing I brought up is like, yes, compensation is super important. Yes, I believe in giving raises. Yes, yes, yes. Also, resources are finite. And also, there are other ways of retaining staff, like making sure that we have the culture that everybody is feeling valued and respected and heard. And, um, I think that it, it is true that there's a lot of tension, um, but it's something to think about. And I think that other, you know, 
other points have been raised, but um, yeah, I would encourage you not to see it as a personal attack, just like um, oh, like every other pets that we're considering are not necessarily personal attacks. Like we love everybody here, so really. Um, I understand that, and um, just like I recognize that anybody who's being impacted, uh, it would feel personal, and I'm not going to be immune to that as well. So, um, but I'll yeah. I'll turn it over to the chair right now. Uh, Are there any more comments on the side of the station? Um, I appreciate you bringing that up, Callie, um, and I think this uh, absolutely needs more conversation on the board. Um, around the big picture, what are our values and how are they reflected in our decisions? Considerations around what actually is our power um, as a school board? Um, where do we deliberate? Where do we show our thinking? Um, where do we make hard decisions and not just sign off. Um, and, uh, um, and I think that's how, a, that's how a collaborative process can work too, where the board is a part of it. Um, and so yes. out of the box thinking, creative thinking, it, it looks um, a lot of different ways and it isn't always gonna be fun, um, but we bring that as, as public servants, as volunteers, um, and what we're asking a lot of other people to bring here. I think it's it's going to be painful energy, but I think it will reflect a lot about um, how our culture is 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 inclusive in a, a different way, perhaps than what's, what's easier. What's how it has been. Thank you, Alan. Woo! them as the sort of jigsaw puzzle or Jenga game as someone described this evening and I think Callie you raised some interesting solutions that are new to me and I would need to understand the math. I heard Toby say we have time, we can approve this list tonight, we have the next six weeks to contemplate final budget choices and make different choices. Um, I would need to understand sort of scope and scale and what the impact is and sort of where we would move from there. Uh, first of all, Kelly, I want to say thank you for being courageous to bring up uh, these solutions, which you know, when, when we're all sitting together and we are neighbors and friends, it takes courage to bring that up, and it's it is important in the public process, um, and uh, so I do appreciate that. Um, my recommendation is that we. Uh, recognize the two proposals that you suggested, the two ideas that you suggested as uh, potential numbers that we can look at. We need to understand what the impact is, what, is, what does that look like, what additional funding would that provide, and at the same time, uh, what I've heard is that we're going to be continuing to look at other changes, other opportunities, either for additional revenue or for um, you know, things that we, levers that we still can turn between now and when the final budget is, uh, is required to submit. Um, so my recommendation is to, to, uh, to take action on 
the package proposed tonight and keep in mind that these are a couple of uh, options to, to review as we do that work going forward. Any more discussion from the board right now? Okay. So I'll be recommending that the board take action on resolution number uh, 800, uh, the reduction of the educational program as it's been outlined in front of you, and then I'll turn it back over to Toby. Yeah, please. Oh, if we do, if we do approve this tonight, I, I, uh, I, oh, sorry, 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 it's right next to me. I'm not worried about it. Um, if, if we do approve this tonight, I really want to continue the work that we've been doing with all the labor groups. I, I don't want this past week to be just this, like, one-off that we have to, like, rush and, and and have these really significant conversations just for this meeting. Um, I think this is, um, I, I think that we need to continue those conversations with all, all the groups. That would be admin, and everybody needs to be involved in those conversations. So I just, I just want to, I really think that's super, super critical that, I, that we continue those. I don't want this past week to be a one-on-one. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree, thank you. The, um, you know, one thing that uh, was brought up earlier, maybe tonight I'm getting confused of the 100 days of May, <laughs> but the, you know, what we really need is a three-year plan. You know, we can't go through this process every spring. It's too painful and it's disjointed and it's unfair. Uh, and so, you know, these are all uh, options that we have to consider as, as we go through. And so, you know, again, it, it may be something that we, we look at as uh, an important part of a, an extended solvency plan. Uh, are we prepared to uh, to make a decision on this? Is there a motion to approve uh, Resolution 800? Motion. Is that, did you move? Uh, okay. Are we allowed to say anything? Uh, no. Is there a second? I said there's a second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. No. All opposed? No. When? All right. Thank you. I would say my eye is hesitant, and I do think the solutions Cali raises potentially I'd like to look at perhaps at a work session. I recognize time is short, but um, to understand totals on freezes or furloughs to understand sort of how much how much dough is in the map there. I appreciate you, Kelly. We love you, Kelly. Woo! <clears throat> Next up is the uh, consent agenda. Second. All right, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Is there any new business? Okay. All right, well, having concluded the agenda, we'll close the meeting.